I am Dan Wilton, the CEO of First Mining Gold. First Mining is advancing two major projects in Canada, our Spring Pole project in northwestern Ontario, uh, and having just put out our PEA on our Duparquet project in the middle of the Abitibi Gold Belt in Quebec. Dan good to see you. Good love to see you. you. Feet, the face to face. It's always good. It's always good. Now, look, we're at this conference um, here in Colorado Springs. It's pretty. We've been here a while now. The big boys are here, mm -hmm. not just from the uh, mining side, but also the money side as as well. Yeah. Invitation only. So we're in good company. That's that's the good news. <laughs> um, now, why are you here? What do you want to get out? You're clearly going to meet some shareholders, but what do you want to get out of this? Yeah, no, for us, uh, it's this and the Beaver Creek uh, Precious Metals Summit are a couple of the most important conferences of the year. And for us, it really is um, particularly getting the word out on our Duparquet, PEA, uh, which we just put out a couple of weeks ago. You know, it shows a really robust project, 230,000 ounces plus of potential annual production, in the middle of probably the most sought after gold belt in the world. So uh, interesting and robust and lots we can talk to about that. But the other thing that we are very keen on is getting the word out on our spring pole project that, you know, every day we get a step closer to those critical milestones around environmental assessment and getting our EA. I think Biden's coming in now. Biden's coming in now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a nice setup. It um, okay. We, we'll, we'll, let me let me park that up. Yeah. Let, let me do parquet that up. No, no. There you go. Now. Do uh, and let's stay. Let's stay with st lot. exactly. Let me yeah. stay with what's going on over there because yeah. the other thing which I'm hearing, and I want to hear what you're hearing, mm. is about what are these majors here for? What are they, yeah. what are they looking for? What are they seeing? What do they need to see from companies to kind of get those juices flowing? Because they are accruing a, a ton of money at the moment. And everyone's asking, we've seen, seen a few, seen a few more tomorrow, what are you going to do with the cash? Do you know anything? Yeah, well, so I think uh, at some point that cash needs to be redeployed into productive assets in the mining industry, right? Mm. They can't just return it all to shareholders because in the end, they're in a depleting resource business, right? So I think what I'm taking away from these last couple of conferences is that there's... Uh, some really um, interesting momentum mm -hmm. in a way that we haven't really felt it before where, uh, you know, projects, when you're talking about a project that could, you know, come into, uh, go into construction in 2026 or 2027, when you're talking about that in 2020, it's still not in anyone's five-year plan, mm -hmm. right? What we're really hearing now is, you know, companies are kind of formulating, what is that five-year and long-term, long-range uh development plan for their assets, they're starting to see gaps. And it was always going to happen because they haven't been able to find anything. They haven't spent money on exploration or development. And so we're having actually pretty concrete discussions and had another one this morning about, you know, a bigger company that has a couple of projects to build in the next two years. So what we really want is something that, you know, the construction might be three or four years out right. in, in a core jurisdiction, in a tier one jurisdiction with district scale exploration potential around it and, you know, uh, where you know that you can continue to grow those resources. So that's where I think our projects check a lot of the boxes. It's just that they are every day becoming more real, right? And it's getting closer and that scarcity value is starting to get recognized. I think, well, I think we talked last time out in terms of, you know, permitting, et cetera. It's not a one box to tick. Yeah. And it's, there's a whole bunch of boxes that you're kind of worked your way through. We, we, what did we go with, Musk? 60% done. Was there something like that? I, I kind of can't remember. No, we five, yeah, there are five of seven years. So right. let's put it at uh, okay. uh, yeah, yeah. 70. 70%. Okay. Yeah. So you're kind of going through the phases there. And for them, that's kind of interesting um, in the sense that it feels more certain. Yeah. And that's your job to, yep. to say that yeah, it is. De risked. What I'm finding fascinating is. Usually these majors or mid-tiers wait until the things that they're looking at are seemingly super expensive. There are deals to be done now. Yeah. They're, and they're sort of latching on to the fact that, well, maybe we don't need to wait so long. Maybe we can sort of step our way into projects, it, it feels like. Uh, you hope so, and we're having some of those discussions, and it's around, you know, would you be interested in an investment at the project level rather than a strategic investment in the yeah. company? and. There's lots to think about in terms of different structures of how those things can go forward. But the important part is that kind of recognized 
that that shortfall is there and that they need to be strategic about getting into projects. Mm. And the real, you know, the real question that they should be asking themselves is, if I don't do it now, like, how much cheaper is this stuff going to yeah. get? You know, yeah. this is the time for a contrarian investor, you know, or a mining company who's trying to act counter cyclically. The reason they got lambasted in the past wasn't because they added projects. It's because they waited until the projects were like fully baked mm-hmm. and bought them at the top of the market at $200 an ounce. Now, let's be clear. I wouldn't mind selling our projects for $200 an ounce. <laughs> But you can buy them in the market today yeah. for seven dollars an ounce, right? Yeah. So yeah. this is a time when you really want to be kind of digging in, understanding where are the projects that you like and where you go from there. But I think they like that deal. And first <laughs> through that door, first through that door. Come back, um, right? Because <laughs> they, they, they're the guys who are going to buy it at two hundred dollars an ounce. <laughs> hey, okay, well, <laughs> shouldn't laugh. It, all serious, serious stuff. There are deals being done here. It, it feel it feels like that we're sort of seeing lots yeah. of conversations, yeah. hearing lots of conversations. So yeah. I think it is momentum feels like it's coming back. It doesn't feel like in the equities market. No, for sure. But there's a lag. There's a lag to this. We'll see where we go. We'll see what the ECB does. We'll see what the Fed does. Yeah. Hopefully nothing too brutal. Oh, I think I think you know the other thing is we're we're poised for what I think could be. Everyone's waiting for a gold price movement, and it seems pretty inevitable at this point. Mm. Uh, does that is that the thing that's that kind of spurs them to act? You know, the producers might move in share prices before the developers. Does that open a gap up even bigger? I don't think that's the limiting factor right now. It's not that you know development projects are expensive. I think it really is only, you know, some concern about CapEx and where does the CapEx fit in their own cash flow? And do we really believe that the gold price is going to stay at 1950? Because if you believe that, then you could certainly take on more projects. Right. Okay. And I guess the other aspect to this is the availability of large scale projects for those guys and gals. Yeah. Because I think what we, again, the stuff we're seeing is, so we talked about here, and we've talked about numerous times, is jurisdictional risk. So there yeah. are projects all around the world. Um, not many at scale, not yeah. many within a short time frame. And that's that's what they're going to be looking for. So jurisdictional risk is a key, a very key component these days. As more so than ever. The scale and the economics is clearly important to them and what they can bring to the table um, as well. In Canada, not so many left at a reasonable scale. Not so many left. You know, we have a good chart in our, uh, in our corporate presentation on our website that shows if you look at all the projects that are in construction today, it's it's uh, it tells a pretty interesting story in that probably five of the top fifty oh, so let's say five of the top seven or eight projects in Canada right now in mm-hmm. terms of resource uh, are ones that are actually in construction so right. Cote and Hard Rock and um, Blackwater et cetera et cetera. What that says to me is the big projects are the strategic ones that get built right. Mm-hmm. You then fast forward to when the ones that are in construction right now are finished. So that's still another year, 18 months. Um, When those are finished, First Mining is going to own two of the 10 largest undeveloped gold projects in Canada and one of the most advanced from a permitting perspective. And I just don't think that resonates with people. I like it. It doesn't seem intuitive that this is, you know, look around the world. These are these are some of the largest and some of the most advanced projects mm. in a tier one jurisdiction that, you know, that still today can buy at seven dollars an ounce. It's kind of like a fa- it's a phasing exercise, yeah. really, of yeah. fa- phasing the gold in. It's logistics if you think about it. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, for sure. And if you and if you don't order the gold, it ain't going to be there when you need it. So it's a, it's a little bit so it's awfully simplistic. Yeah. And don't mean to be glib, but that's the truth of the matter. Right. Um, now, I'm, as, as, as a kind of retail investor, a humble retail investor looking for the next deal, I've got to, I'm trying to time the market as best I can. I, mean, mm. I want to time the bottom perfectly. Who wouldn't? Um, what are you hearing with regards to kind of the macro conversations? What, what, what are people believing is going to happen to gold um, in terms of its role yeah. globally? Yeah. The US dollar, the anti U.S. dollar yep. conversations. Any any concerns around that from fund managers? Ah, uh, you know, I think uh, all of those things point positively to gold. I think they point potentially to a period of, you know, macroeconomic and probably short term, you know, stock market disruption. Um, but no, I think you know, 
the writing seems to kind of be on the wall that the fact that with, even though you've had interest rates rise to where they are and you have the unsustainability of debts and debt levels in, you know, every G7 country. And um, I think with all of those things, we're moving toward a point where I think it's no lose for gold, right? Mm-hmm. Basically, if you can't get inflation under control and you're going to have to raise rates, well, that to me says they never thought that they were going to get it under control. Yeah. It's going to be higher for longer. You want to own real assets and you want to own gold. And if they really have managed to, you know, execute the soft landing, I think there you're at a point where interest rates start rolling over if inflation is, you know, well and truly conquered. Um, interest rate starts going down and your cost, you know, opportunity cost of gold goes down. I think you see gold go up. So what's interesting is I think really gold's been supported at this 1900 level by central banks around the world. Yeah most of whom are, you know, bricks or bricks aspirational. And that to me says, you know, that day of rollover of the U.S. dollar is probably coming sooner than we might think. And, you know, there's probably a macroeconomic uh, kind of calamity event that comes with that. It's it's, it's interesting. I I think Europe, we're going to see, I don't think there'll be any soft landing. I don't... You know, one of the biggest biggest economic players, Germany, is, yeah. is, is, is strong right. nation, right? Yeah. Um, we, you know, print, printing money has has not helped at all, and quite frankly, a, a, a hard landing. So we can sort of deal with the realities of it. And the U.S. has it's got a synthetic protection against the hard landing. I'm not sure that's the right thing. But yeah, net net, good for gold. I think it's good for gold. I think gold's sitting at a at a no lose situation. Listen, it might not be forever. But is there going to be a period where, you know, we could see gold have a serious leg up at 2,500, 3,000? I mean, I, you know, I keep coming back to the last cycle, let's call it uh, 2000 to 2011, and your sort of trough to peak gold price was 260 to 1900. So, you know, more than 3x or more than 6x. Could you see 6X from the trough of this cycle, call it $1,100 gold? Is there anything that says you couldn't see, you know, seven, six thousand, seven thousand dollars $6,000, $7,000 gold? I don't, I don't think there's anything that says that that can't happen. It's just going to be relative to, you know, all the other financial assets, which I think are going to struggle as well. Yeah. But, you know, like That's- in a reasonable long term, you know, a lot of our shareholders talk to us about what happens in a $2,500 or $3,000 gold price environment and i think that's not unrealistic for you know a 12 to 18 month time let's play a game yeah you just put up pea okay we have okay so we're talking about what people think gold may get to yeah right so i want to look at your pea and understand that clearly you're not getting to production tomorrow so the pa is just an indicative set of set of numbers talk me through what Talk me through a way that people could interpret a PA like yours in terms of some of the variables that they would need to put a number into a blank box and go, well, do you know what? If I, if I do this math, I can get to a point where I can value a company. Say yours yep. using your PA, okay? Yep. So let's say I think gold will get to 2500 bucks. Yeah. Okay? If I insert that into your PA, what other assumptions do I need to fiddle with to kind of get to it? A bottom line number. Well, most of the rest of them are laid out. And, you know, the real question is, what do you think the, you know, the capital and operating cost environment's in when gold's at 2,500? That's mm-hmm. the biggest thing you kind of have to take a view on. But if you just want to understand the resource leverage to the gold price, which is one of the main reasons why I think countercyclical uh, investors should really be looking at development projects right now mm-hmm. has everything to do with his asset leverage because we ran our gold price uh, or a PEA at a, a gold price of $1,800. For every $100 on the gold price, it's about $250 million of pre-tax NPV, mm-hmm. like $120 million of after-tax NPV. Okay, from, like, eight, from 18. From 18. And on, okay. a, base, on a base case of uh, about a billion dollars pre-tax, and about $588 million after tax NPV. So like what that means is you're talking about more than our market cap in leverage with every $100 in the gold. So my number, I'd be talking about an extra yeah. $840 million bucks. Yeah. Seven times 120. 
Uh, yeah, in 1800 to 2500. On top of your... on, on top of the uh, on the after tax NPV yep. of 600. So yeah, okay. all of a sudden that's you know. So if I believe in gold, yeah, and I think it's going to 2500. Yeah, there's my number. Okay. Yeah, so, but but just remember, yeah, that's one of two advanced stage projects we have, and then you look at Springpole. And the leverage that Springpole has to the gold price, it was run at a $1,600 gold price. Mm-hmm. Um, after tax NPV, about a billion US. Mm-hmm. Pre tax NPV, 1.5. And for every $100, it's $250 million of pre tax NPV US and another $150 million of after tax NPV. Right. So, now you're levering those things up because they add up all in the same thing. Uh, you can see how that's where you know you're talking about I'm over a billion with my number. So if I get, you're 16, I'm at 2,500. So I'm over a billion, like a billion, at nearly 11, 1.1 billion on top of what? What was your on the top of the, a billion? Business? Yet uh, after tax at Springpool was like just shy of a billion US. Okay, so pretty quickly, numbers. those numbers add up. If right? I believe gold's going close. If I yeah. don't, maybe go invest in something else. It's all good. Yeah, and I mean, part of it is just the, the, you can value that as an option right now, right? You believe that there's, you know, a probability, you know, there's a distribution in which you think gold might go down, might stay the same, or gold up. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think there's a lot of a lot of different ways you can look at it, but the one thing that is absolutely certain is your producer is going to have real like near-term cash flow leverage to that increase, that cash flow leverage is going to be on a relative, you know, operating cost basis. But let's say they're at a 50% margin and the, you know, the gold price goes up by 10%, then, you know, they'll maybe get 20% mm-hmm. increase in, in cash flow. Mm-hmm. It's great. Um, but you don't get nearly that same leverage as the benefit of the starting point, which is only because... You know, we're trading at such a discount to that NAV value already. Mm-hmm. But the other thing is, as you get further on in development of these projects and you get into a different gold price environment, that, you know, multiple of net asset value that developers tends to trade at goes up, right? Mm-hmm. And in good times, uh, you know, going back to the last cycle, that probably averaged 0.5 to 0.7 times. And, you know, companies would usually either put projects into into production and then trade at one or they'd sell the asset at one to an acquirer who, you know, would then go and build the project. So, you know, you've got basically you know, five to seven X leverage just on that multiple. Mm-hmm. And then we've already seen you've got, you know, several times leverage on the gold price just because of the size uh, of the gold resources in the ground that, you know, aren't going anywhere. Right. Run. Okay. So that was a good game. That was really kind of allowing you to actually maybe lay out a case, which I, th- which I think for some people watching this or reading this, they perhaps don't quite know how to do that. So yeah. that's a fine exercise. And for all the experts watching this who know how to do these things, yeah. I'm sure you'll have a different view, but it's a good <laughs> starting point to work out how you value a company yeah. and how you get a sense of what the returns could be for you. And even if you discount it by 50%, yeah. Gives you a good sense of the, the types of returns you can get. So that's, yeah. that's all good. Yeah. Um, for you though, we you're going through the phases. You're not sitting by hunkering down. You you're, you're getting getting on with this. Yeah. Not getting much lower appreciation in the market because no precious metal company. Well, very few. Yeah. Are getting any lower. I can count on one hand how many are. Yeah. Um. So this this is about this is about. Well, what next, I guess, is the point. Well, what next? What do we do? For us, uh, you know, so it's uh, continuing to move spring pole forward through the environmental assessment process. So right. It's all going very well. And, but, you know, but that's a process. It's, it's a process. Cheap. It's it cheap. does take time. Just right? take time. So do park A, PEA, yeah. what do you do next? Uh, do park A, PEA. So importantly, we've raised $5 million of flow-through funding so mm-hmm. we can continue drilling at do park A. Mm-hmm. It's one of the things we've really come to appreciate is we've got to know and understand this resource. Yeah. Is that it's got uh, an, in, an, an in-situ value, or an in, in-situ uh, about 6.5 million ounces over 4 kilometers of strike length. Now, a million and a half, that has been mined out. So the resource that we have is what's left, right? Mm -hmm. But in 500 meters of vertical, for you to have six and a half million ounces, 
in an area of the world like the Abitibi that has really strong vertical continuity, mm. you would expect, you look at other assets in the Abitibi, the deeper you go, it does actually tend to blow out. Yeah. Now, some of that's lower like get, grade. Get you better. Can... We're worried about your terminology. Some, right. Again, for an audience, they don't yeah. like, low out means get bigger. Yeah, yeah. They, they tend to get larger okay. uh, and, and higher grade. Right. Okay. So that, I think, uh, shows some of the opportunity. Now, you need higher grade mineralization the deeper that you go. But so far, we've got really, really good continuity in the mineralization here. We know it's been mined underground because it was mined underground for 20 years from 1933 to you know, the mid-1950s. So um, I think it's just a lot of opportunity to demonstrate, for us to demonstrate that, that we're not going to drill it all into reserves, but just to show that this is the starting point right. for this uh, mine. And if you find higher grade areas that you can, you know, maybe get to sooner in a mine plan. Well, see, the, the, this, 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 this is the kind of really important bit here because you can just keep drilling it out and... Make make the resource resource bigger. Yeah, people go, oh, but it's already big enough. I'm <laughs> interested in how you guys think about this in terms of the plan is to get into revenue, mm. right? We're not gold producer, copper producer, silver producer. We're here to get into revenue. You're going to make money. So, um, in terms of the way that you're trying to work out the, the how the ore body works and are there higher higher grade components, you know, near the surface, or is there more to be found? Under the surface, yep. And then more importantly, how do we quickly get it to surface, process it, <laughs> and actually get some money going? Just in terms of uh, sort of anti-dilutory type yeah, behavior, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, which is you know important, especially in this day and age where sure. we're drilling to the edge of the envelope is kind of passe. Yeah. Now it's about how do you exist in this in this mining world? How do you compete? How do you compete for cash? How do you deliver what you're meant to deliver, which is, you know, the money. Show me the money. Yeah, I think, listen, with Duparquet, there's still, uh, with this PEA done as a snapshot of a development plan, mm. there is a real conversation to be had with the regulators around the project, particularly the Ministry of Mines and Ministry of Environment. Understand what that permitting time frame might look like for this mm. project as we've scoped it. But the other thing to understand is that there are a bunch of underutilized mills in the Abitibi, mm -hmm. and a few of them within 100 kilometers of this project. Mm -hmm. So if you didn't have to permit a tailing dam and you didn't have to permit a processing facility or water treatment plant, yeah. you can generally get to that cash flowing decision a lot quicker. Now, we're not there, but I think that's one of the things that we've come to appreciate about this, having gone through to scope. The only thing we can scope, which is what's in your own control, uh, I think that shows that there is a really meaningful size of the prize for a bigger project here. Mm -hmm. Now, the next step for us, part of that is understanding, are there any interim steps that can get us somewhere there more quickly, leveraging the infrastructure that's in the area already? But is that, a, a, well, I guess there's lots of options, right? From like, like DSO, or you do, you, you could come to some agreement with, the mill owner and say right and they'll try well negotiate some sort yeah, of fee, yeah. fee type structure or you buy something yeah it might make sense and there's this arbitrage between trucking it a long distance versus so you know actually if we built our own whether however whatever size we yeah. could recoup our costs in within three four five years yeah. our, our size. So, so there's so many options there but permitting is a big key part of that decision making for you it is you, money's good yeah. anytime. Waiting for permits with no money is not so nice. We know a bit about that. But, there may, but there may be it's like an, an interim type solution for you is what you're saying. There could be. And that's okay. something that we'll kind of continue to investigate. And, you know, there's not a lot that we can talk about as we do that. But just, you know, it's the benefit of having this sizable deposit and good grade deposit in the middle of an area that's been an active mining area for a hundred years and one of the most sought after mining districts on the planet. Yeah. So there's, yeah, there's uh, lots of different options for us to kind of try and run to ground here in terms of accelerating that. But, you know, the base case for us, number one is, uh, what's it going to take for us to sort of get this permitted on its own? And, uh, what else are we going to find over the right. course of the next year as we make sure that we're really understanding this ore body and work. Right. Big guys here, you're attractive because of the size, you're attractive because of the location, 
Now you need to make it pretty and wrap a bow around it by making sure that clearly permits are in place, the economics understood, the metallurgy is understood. Um, and at that point, you can, you can actually you know, start the process of actually working at how do you manage both of those assets within one one company, presumably? Yeah. Because again, it, it strikes me that either of those is big enough for any one company. Yeah. And that that could be part of your economics going forward. Yeah, and I think a part of it is uh, you know having having both opens up the option of partnership on one or the other or both. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and they don't doesn't all have to happen in the same way at the same time. Right, can kind of I guess come at it from a couple of different angles. Right. Okay. Well, that's that is a really cool conversation. I've enjoyed that. Yeah. Because I kind of I kind of feel like well, I've learned something about you know, maybe valuing companies, um, but I understand how you're coming at your assets, I'm not burning through cash like a like you know, crazy, crazy person. <laughs> uh, and ho- hopefully when the market comes back, there's, there's some appreciation of what, not just what you've got, but how they actually start to grow and sort of drive that sort of leverage returns that people and, are looking for. Yeah. And as, as we've always said, you know, the goal was to kind of have these projects ready at the time that the industry is going to need the most. Mm. And I think we're, we're coming into the line of sight of that, right? I think that's Looks within like, the next couple of years. Looks like. So, you know, um, in a better gold price environment with leverage to gold price with uh, you know, leverage to improving valuation metrics uh, and leverage to resource growth through exploration. Like if anyone is looking at where am I going to invest in the mining sector right now for maximum leverage in the turn, the developers are the maximum leverage. And I think, you know, look at first mining goal because we got a lot to offer on that. For- Got it. Thank you. Good math. All right.